This is KGW News at Noon. Should Portland State University disarm campus police? There has been heated debate since a deadly shooting earlier this year. Today, the people are getting a chance to voice their concerns. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Brenda Braxton. KGW's Tim Gordon is joining us now live at PSU. And Tim, the first of these so-called listening sessions has just started. Yeah, right now, Brenda, and there's going to be nine of these led by an outside consultant over the next three days as the school tries to gather as much input as possible before making any decisions or changes. We know from PSU's Board of Trustees meeting early this month, there is very vocal opposition to the school security force keeping its guns. Most at that meeting called for immediate disarmament. This issue boiled over after the shooting death of Jason Washington last summer by two campus officers. He was trying to break up a fight and reach for a gun that he was legally able to carry after it dropped from its holster. Although many, including student union leaders and faculty, called for fast action, PSU leaders say they want to make decisions based on the best information and most input they can gather. And part of the independent consultant's job is to gather input in these hour and a half long listening forums. So it's not just people who are one, on one side of this or the other. The idea is to get, you know, everybody has a chance, an opportunity to come in and weigh in on campus safety. And it's not just about disarming. This is a much bigger conversation. But for many on campus, the main emphasis and first order of business is about armed officers or not. And students are talking. I think actions speak louder than words, and I really think that they need to take steps to disarm PSU rather than just hear the complaints of the students. I think cops should have guns. Uh, if cops didn't have guns, make it a more hostile place, I think, or it, it'd leave risk for something to happen. Now, these forums are at PSU's Academic and Student Recreation Center in room 515. It's just about a block away from us here. They run today through Thursday, as I said, three sessions a day at various times. Anyone who wants to have a say is welcome. That includes the general public. Now, the consultants are also pushing out a survey for those who'd like to participate in that way. And of course, all this gathering takes time. The consultants hope to have uh, their information and recommendations ready by the end of the year. Brenda, back to you. Thank you, Tim. It's a day of mourning in Pittsburgh as the Jewish community in Squirrel Hill buries the first victims from the massacre at the Tree of Life Synagogue. President Trump is in Pennsylvania right now. NBC's Jay Gray reports. We're just spending some holidays today. Sharing flowers with strangers, giving blood, this grieving community searching for ways to cope as they prepare for the first of 11 funerals today. These are good, decent people. Um, they didn't have a, an ounce of hate in any of them. Brothers Cecil and David Rosenthal will be buried side by side, the same way they spent most every weekend at the Tree of Life. A separate service will be held for Dr. Jerry Rabinowitz today survivors gathering to honor their friends. Bang, 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 afraid that the next shot I hear will be a bullet in my back. Some though, still unable to shake the horror of the attack. President Trump travels to Pittsburgh this afternoon. He'll spend time with survivors and families of the victims. Well, I'm just gonna pay my respects. I'm also he comes at a time when the pain and emotions for many are still raw. Leaders of Behind the Ark, a progressive Jewish group, publishing an open letter saying he's not welcome until he denounces white nationalism and stops targeting minorities in his rhetoric and policies. But the rabbi of the synagogue, inside as the shots rang out, says it's important for the president to be here. It would be my honor to, to always meet a president of the United States. And, and we turn <clears throat> me, to, to the leaders of our, of our country. As they struggle to deal with the attack on their faith. Jay Gray, NBC News, Pittsburgh. And we have the latest from Pittsburgh on air and online. Go to KGW.com or our KGW Facebook page. New developments in a homicide case near Camp Nemanu, north of Sandy. Police have arrested the victim's husband, 45-year-old Martin Gallo Gallardo. 
is facing a murder charge now. He's accused of killing his wife, 38-year-old Coral Rodriguez Lorenzo. Someone found her body in a ditch on Camp Nemanu Road Sunday. She'd been reported missing here in the Portland area. Well, it's confirmed a tornado touched down in Forest Grove yesterday afternoon. It's now the third one in Oregon this week. This morning, meteorologists from the National Weather Service were out looking at the damage. Christine Pitowanich caught up with them in Forest Grove and joins us live. So, Christine, what convinced them this was a tornado? Brenda, they took in a lot of factors into account, but mainly they talked about the damage they saw to this greenhouse. You can see the twisted metal here. We're at a nursery in Forest Grove that also serves as home base for a construction company. The meteorologists I spoke with tell me they also rely on witness statements. And today we spoke with one man who saw the funnel cloud and dark skies. He described the chaotic experience. That big building that you see right there is where I was at. Steve Grossaint had quite the exciting day at work yesterday. First, he didn't know what was going on when the paneling on the side of this building nearly came off. It was dust and debris and garbage cans are flying. That's because outside a funnel cloud had formed in Forest Grove. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Look at all the weeds. This video sent to us by a viewer. Grisaint says he saw the same thing when he finally came outside. It was just black over there. So and then the funnel cloud was just white and you could just see it slowly moving around. And when he looked over at one of the greenhouses, this is what he saw. Twisted, mangled metal. Yeah, I think shot. He says the property owner saw the tornado touch down by this pond, then ran for safety. That's the truck that he dove underneath the trailer. That's kind of interesting. Today, National Weather Service meteorologists showed up to survey the damage and see if it really was a tornado that touched down. We're here in the evidence gathering mode, seeing what damage is left behind, seeing what's still here. After walking the property for 15 or 20 minutes, they had a verdict. All this damage is from a tornado. It was very short lived. I would equate it to like a pen, putting a pen dot down on a page. That's how fast it dropped down and then lifted back up. And that jives with what Grossaint remembers. He says the whole thing lasted maybe 30 seconds. Quite a feat, considering this greenhouse has kept itself standing through a lot. We've had a lot of snow out here in the past and those things don't budge and this thing just just blew apart. So there's also another reason the National Weather Service meteorologists think the tornado was short lived. This pile of bark and dust you see nearby looks undisturbed. The meteorologists say the tornado's strength and intensity won't really be determined until later today once they have taken all this information and they're able to evaluate it at their Portland office. Back to you. Let us know what happens. Wow, thank you very much, Christine. A tornado also touched down in a rural area of Marion County yesterday. A viewer in Jefferson sent us this video. The National Weather Service confirms this was an EF zero tornado. That means winds between 65 and 85 miles an hour and minimal damage. The storm knocked down a stop sign here and several trees. Crews from the Jefferson Fire District also saw it and shot video as well. And I saw leaves starting to swirl and I was like, oh, here comes a, you know, a tornado. It was just pretty incredible. No, I've never seen anything like it before. The, the clouds were just swirling so fast and very, very black, black clouds. Fire crews drove around Jefferson to make sure people were safe and they were. No one was hurt during the storm. Okay, the big weather issue this morning was fog. Look at that video showing what people faced as they drove into work. So, Rod, you were telling me there is an upside to the fog. Can you explain? Well, you know, we've had two stormy days, right? We had the tornado in North Portland on Sunday. You just covered what happened yesterday. So you wake up the following morning, it's foggy. That tells you a number of things. Number one, winds are calm. Number two, basically you're in the middle of kind of a calm field and the storm threat is over. So the fog, a very welcome sight this morning. Um, and right now it's still cloudy up and down much of the I-5 corridor, but you get away from the flats of the valley and we have a lot of sun. Here's our Yaquina Bay Newport camera at the beach, 55 degrees. And then if you skip over the valley and go up to Mount Hood, beautifully clear blue skies. And look at all the snow, by the way. If you haven't heard, the lodge picked up uh, 10 inches of snow 
yesterday, Sunday night and Monday. How about that? And they're at 33 degrees, so it's not melting, at least not right now. But that elevation will be getting rain, it looks like, overnight tonight into tomorrow. Now we're in the flats of the valley. The Reserve Vineyards and Golf Club in Aloha, it's only 46 degrees. The low clouds keeping any temperature uh, warmth from happening. We have a little bit of a break here in Silverton down in the mid valley at the Oregon Garden. So we have some clearing in spots, but not very many. We're at 51 degrees. So assuming we get some sun breaks developing in the coming hour or two, we'll get up to about 58 degrees. That'll warm us up a good 10 degrees or so. And then we'll cloud up going into early evening. Once we get past seven, We'll be looking for a push of steady rain. We'll track that into your trick or treat hours coming up in just a bit. And real quick, Brenda, remember that Forest Grove video where you could see the, the dark spinning funnel cloud? Yep. And it looked like it wasn't really touching the ground. That's a reminder, you can't always visually see the actual tornado touching the ground. Just because you don't see the entire dark column all the way down low doesn't mean you don't have that vortex of spinning air. That could have been the case in Forest Grove. Most definitely, Rod. Thank you for all the info. The man accused of torturing and killing an 89-year-old Portland woman was arraigned this morning. Timothy Mackley pleaded not guilty to multiple charges, including aggravated murder and sex abuse. An indictment alleges he broke into Marcine Herrink's home back in September and kidnapped her. She was missing for six days. Authorities found her body in the trunk of Mackley's car. The midterm elections are exactly one week away, and President Trump is pushing for a new hardline immigration policy. He wants to end birthright citizenship. Yes, we're the only country in the world where a person comes in, has a baby, and the baby is essentially a citizen of the United States for 85 years with all of those benefits. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And it has to end. He made that comment on Axios on HBO, saying he'll sign an executive order changing the 14th Amendment. President Trump wants to get rid of the clause that guarantees citizenship to children born in the U.S. The question today is, can he actually do that? Most constitutional scholars say no, but the president says his lawyers believe he can. Expect any move by the White House to face huge legal challenges.